This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts, podcast guests, their employers or affiliates may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. This is Matt Russell, and today we are breaking down First Citizens Bank. I'm joined by investors with a bit of history investing in banks. It's Bill Negrin and Alex Fitch of Oakmark. And I will admit, I was a bit embarrassed that I didn't know more about First Citizens when they acquired Silicon Valley Bank out of FDIC receivership. But when I brought this up to others, I started to notice that was almost universally the sentiment. This breakdown will help explain why. First Citizens is a bank with 125 year plus history, but they don't operate like the bulge bracket Wall Street banks. They don't host quarterly conference calls. They have a playbook and they execute it. And the SVB transaction fell into that playbook. Bill and Alex offer a really unique macro and micro view on bank investing and what stood out about First Citizens. While I wasn't familiar with First Citizens and many others weren't either, Bill and Alex have been investors since 2021. So they have a bit of history, they can explain the management team, and much, much more. Please enjoy this conversation on First Citizen Bank. All right, Bill and Alex, I'm extremely excited to have you here. It's a timely discussion. At the same time, it's a timeless discussion when it comes to banks. So I thought a good place to start was big picture. You are not tourists when it comes to investing in banks. Even with First Citizens, it's a name you've owned for several years. So Bill, I thought you might be a good person to answer the question just on philosophy of investing in banks. How does your philosophy of investing with banks differ from when you're looking at investing in other industries? Obviously, everybody knows what a bank is, but I don't think there's a lot of thought as to how you actually operate a bank. And certainly in the wake of all the problems recently with SVB and First Republic, We've learned that a lot of people in both the government and the media don't really understand how banking works. So I'm going to just start with an example. Let's say I wanted to open a bank and I put $100,000 in in cash. So I've got $100,000 of equity, no debt. And then you come along and say, you've got $900,000 that you'd like to invest in a savings account. So now I've got a million dollars in cash, 900,000 deposits and 100,000 in equity. My deal with you is I'll give you something like 150 basis points less than I can earn on T-bills. And that's enough to cover my expenses for record keeping, processing your transactions, and running a branch banking network. So if I collect 5% on the T-bills I invest in, that's 50,000. I pay you 32,000 of interest. That's 3.5% on your money. I have net interest income of about 18,000 before my expenses. And then I have about 100 basis points of expenses, leaving me with $8,000 before tax, 6,000 after. So I'm earning a 6% ROE on my investment. Now, clearly that's a very low risk bank, but it doesn't return enough to be worth my $100,000 investment. So nobody would run a bank on those terms. So I get smarter and I say, Alex wants to buy a house. So instead of a million dollars in T-bills, I decide to write a mortgage to Alex. I collect 150 basis points over treasuries. So now that same math works out to me earning a 17% return on equity. And you can start to see the attraction of banking. But there are three huge risks that I've created. Credit risk, liquidity risk, and duration risk. So start with credit. What happens if Alex stops paying on his mortgage? Well, then I don't have the money to pay you back on your deposits. So credit risk is always the most important risk that banks have to focus on. The other risk of liquidity is I'm giving you daily withdrawal rights on your money, but Alex doesn't have to give me his mortgage back until 30 years go by. 
So I've got a huge asset liability mismatch and managing that is a very important aspect running a good bank. Lastly, what happens if rates go up? I can't change the rate Alex is paying on his mortgage because that's contractual, but you expect higher rates on your savings account because rates are now higher. So I've also got a big duration risk in the bank, and that too has to be managed to have a long-term successful bank. So to us, it's kind of disingenuous when you hear people saying today as they look at what happened to Silicon Valley that banks shouldn't be run in a risky way. Banking is all about risk. You're taking short-term deposits, you're making long-term loans, you're expecting people to pay back that money, you're making an estimate of how long the deposits will stay with you. And all of banking is to get enough diversification in your depositors and your borrowers so that instead of me dealing with a one or 2% chance that Alex defaults on his mortgage, I've got enough mortgages out there that I can make a pretty good guess that one or 2% of the people will default. And as analysts looking at the banking industry, we look at it and say, it's generally a commodity business. It's hard to run a bank so well that it's a better than average business, but the people become even more important in banking than they are in most industries because the leverage is so high. In most industries, if a management team risks 10% of their assets, they're also risking about 10% of their equity. In banking, if you risk 10% of your assets, you're putting the entire equity at risk. So to us, the people become exceptionally important in banking, as well as the quantitative analysis of how good a job they're doing managing the risks that they're underwriting. And if I were to just drill down into those three risks that you mentioned, credit risk, which I think was a major theme from the financial crisis, and then liquidity risk and duration risk. Do you have any way of categorizing those against one another in terms of your ability to assess whether a management team is appropriately managing for each of those risks and how those risks might differ as an investor when you're looking at the business? Do you think about them differently in terms of their overall risk to the bank itself and its ability to suffer some minor hiccups versus, as you mentioned, risk the entire bank itself? Well, I think there's some degree of quantitative analysis here where you can look at what percentage of the loans are making payments on time, what percent have defaulted, what percent recovery there is, an estimate of loan to value. On duration, there's a lot of data that gets printed in the annual report in 10K about how the company's results are likely to change as interest rates move up or down. But I think equally important is the qualitative side of understanding how the management team thinks about risk. While there's a lot that you can find in the reports that the companies distribute, accounting is somewhat opaque in financial services. That's why the people side becomes so important. Alex, good opportunity to bring you in here and introduce First Citizens. It's certainly an extremely large bank, but perhaps not the same type of household name as a Bank of America or a JP Morgan. So how do you think about categorizing First Citizens Bank within the overall banking ecosystem? And maybe we can actually rewind prior to some of the recent deals, but when you were looking and first purchasing the business back in 2021, some of the dynamics that attracted you to this business then? So First Citizens probably is the most important bank that almost no one has heard of. It's a 125-year-old bank. It's been run by the same family for three generations. They have more than $200 billion in assets, 550 branches, the 16th largest bank in the US. And despite this size, up until recently, this was a company that had never held a public conference call, that had never hosted an investor meeting or been the subject of a sell-side report. It's also probably been the best performing bank stock in the market over the last two decades. You've seen the stock price compound right alongside tangible book value per share at about a mid-teens clip for almost 20 years. First Citizens roots are in the Carolinas. It started as First Citizens of North Carolina. The Carolina markets are still a third of deposits or a little bit more than that today. 
and First Citizens is the number four bank by market share there. Only California is bigger in their mix. And for most of its history, it's been a pretty plain vanilla banking business. It's focused on gathering deposits through great customer service, earning a spread through conservative lending to its customer base in those markets, primarily wealthy individuals and small businesses. It doesn't have the capital markets or investment banking type businesses that the other large banks have. It doesn't do much in the way of risky lending. It's really spent most of its history focused on gathering deposits and lending money to its customers. And it's done that job well. It has a long history of very low deposit costs, meaningfully below the average large bank, it has a long history of very low loan losses that have allowed the business to be consistently profitable through this cycle, including in 2008 when so many other banks had huge credit problems and many failed. But for as plain vanilla as the operations have been, the capital allocation has been far less conventional. Over the last 15 years, First Citizen's done some 27 acquisitions, the vast majority of which were actually FDIC-assisted takeovers of failing banks. And it's been an enormously accretive set of transactions that have, by and large, worked out exceptionally well with First Citizen's turning into the top 15 bank it is today. The background on First Citizens and our relationship there was we had followed CIT for a long period of time. The story with CIT had always been that they had really solid lending businesses with a lot of expertise in some key verticals and high yielding loans, but that they were disadvantaged from a funding cost perspective. They started off wholesale funded, which is much more expensive than deposits, and then built an online bank with very high deposit costs and acquired a handful of second tier deposit franchises. And you're left with this bank that had high yielding assets, but overly expensive liabilities. So it never earned the return on equity that we tend to see in banking peers of something north of 10%. First Citizens was in the exact opposite position. It had a great deposit franchise, very low cost deposits, but its loans were relatively low yielding and it had more deposits than it could really fully deploy into its loan book. First Citizens really first came to our attention in 2020 when they announced that they were acquiring CIT in an all-stock deal. At the time, CIT was at something like 40% of book value. And so First Citizens was going to end up with about 61% ownership in the combined bank for contributing only 40% or so of the assets. And to us, this looked like an excellent deal. You could take the very low cost funding at First Citizens, pair it with the really high yielding loans at CIT, and liquidate your low yielding assets to pay off those expensive liabilities at CIT. So you had a very natural banking synergy there. On top of that, I think CIT had had relatively bloated operations for a long period of time. And aside from the opportunity to become more efficient in any bank deal, you usually have cost overlap and synergy opportunities that amount to 20, 25% of the target cost base. So there was a big opportunity to remove costs from CIT through the closing of this deal as well. The combination on paper did something like adding 50% to the earnings power for citizens, taking the earnings per share up from around $50 a share before the deal to $75 post deal. So Learning about the acquisition and coming to understand all the ways in which it would create value, we dug into First Citizens. And what we found was that this off-the-radar bank is run by one of the better management teams in the business. And that this CIT deal, in which there was so much value being created, was not the only example of value creation at First Citizens, but rather was a part of a long history of deals like that, including around 17 FDIC-assisted takeovers and around a billion dollars in historic bargain purchase gains, which are essentially gains you get from buying below book value in one of these FDIC auctions. With that realization and coming to understand that history, we dug in and subsequently built it into a large position. This business sounds very interesting. It was a very detailed answer there with a lot that I want to tap into. But just from the early description, as you mentioned, it's the perhaps most important bank that no one has heard of, not hosting conference calls, this deep history of M&A. Share a bit more about that management team and who the leadership is today, how long they've been around, 
and how much they've changed the business model is the M&A and all of those deals and acquisitions. Is that something that's specifically happened within their tenure? The bank's been run by the same family for three generations. RP Holding took over as CEO in 1935 and began what's been a more than 80-year run of consistent management by the Holding family. RP's son, Lewis, took over in the 1950s. He was the CEO of the bank until 2008 when Frank Holding took over. Frank Holding is still the CEO today. Really, the Holding family is deeply intertwined with this bank. Frank and his four sisters own something like 24% of the shares outstanding. They control around 40% of the vote. Frank started in the business at 22, working his way up through junior roles in the bank. His sister, Hope, started at the bank in 1986. Today, she owns almost 5% of the company and is the vice chairman. His brother-in-law, Peter Bristow, is the bank president. The business is very intertwined with the family, and for more than 80 years, they've been running it. The strategy has evolved over time. For a long time, I think they were organically focused, opening branches in adjacent geographies. The acquisitions started before Frank. They've started branching out into various markets through takeovers of banks in other states, but it really accelerated under Frank. He took over in 2008 and you had the financial crisis. And so from 2009 to 2011, there was a lot of opportunity in failed banks through FDIC auctions. So from 2009 to 11, they completed something like a half dozen FDIC assisted takeovers with meaningful gains associated with taking over those businesses. And in the subsequent 12 years, continued down that path. It doesn't feel like there are FDIC auctions and bank failures every year, given how newsworthy the recent ones have been, but there are. And they've relatively consistently found opportunities to buy failed banks through these FDIC auctions at what have been very attractive prices. That's become really a core competency. And it's not the type of advantage you typically think about a bank having. But at this point, they seem to have a real muscle memory around integrating FDIC transactions. They know the processes, they know how they're going to bid, they know on the next day how they're going to begin the integrations, how they're going to structure employee retention packages, how they're going to communicate to depositors. Every step of that process, they've mapped out and executed on north of 15 times now. It gives them a real skill set here that the vast majority of large banks have never even considered building. And when you have something like the Silicon Valley failure come up, that can turn into a real asset. Do they have much competition in these auctions you mentioned? It just seems like a specialty or something that other banks don't even consider doing. But when they are participating in these, are there others that they're often participating against or others who have operated a somewhat similar strategy? There are certainly others that compete in FDIC auctions, but I think the FDIC's own summary of what happened after SVB got sold to citizens is pretty interesting because they criticized themselves for not offering the opportunity to a large enough set of bidders to perhaps extract the highest price they could have from SVB. They haven't publicly said exactly who they restricted, but it's been written in various places that they told hedge funds they couldn't bid on the portfolio. They told the top 10 banks not to bother bidding. They told banks that were smaller than SVB that they were too small, that they needed a larger bank than SVB to assure that the public would be comfortable that the rescue would have staying power. They ruled out banks that would need a capital raise to be able to buy SVB. And then I've also read that they ruled out banks that previously hadn't purchased from the FDIC. So if you consider that First Citizens was barely larger than SVB, at least before the deposit run started at SVB, you were probably talking about only 20 or so banks that were large enough to compete. And of those, the overwhelming majority were not experienced at FDIC takeovers or needed capital. I think it's fair to guess that it was a very, very small number of banks that would have put a bid in on SVB. It reminds me of that quote that for a lot of management teams, it's better to succeed conventionally than fail unconventionally. This is a area 
that requires specific knowledge and specific experience. And for the vast majority of management teams that were allowed to bid, you can imagine the dynamic internally that they're taking on a lot of risk for something they don't fully understand. They don't even know what questions to ask. Being asked to build out this competency in a couple of days and potentially risk their career on this major decision, the likes of which they've never made before. You contrast that with Frank family in their business, they don't have to worry about losing their jobs due to some perceived short-term issue. There's a certain decisiveness that comes with being the ultimate owner and acting like an ultimate owner. Now, they care quite a bit about ensuring First Citizen succeeds, that they maintain this legacy, their family's worth, their position in the community. But there's an ability to act more decisively than when you're a hired CEO who has to be more concerned about others questioning his decisions in the short term. Absolutely. And I think you mentioned earlier, public banks, it's an incredibly opaque market to look at just in terms of the details. And even when you have the details of a loan book, I have to imagine it's incredibly difficult to actually understand what type of risk you're bringing onto your books. So there's certain things and levers that you can pull just in terms of the price that you ultimately pay for adopting that risk or bring that risk onto your books. Are there other things just in terms of the mechanics of what they're doing? You mentioned there's overhead costs that can be brought down, but are there other things that give you comfort that this risk that they're bringing on from SVB is not putting the overall business at risk? First and foremost, we are comforted by the fact that the holding family owns just under 25% of the shares of the business. At Oakmark, we talk a lot about wanting to invest alongside managers that think and act like owners. In this case, they are owners. Frank's never sold a share, at least in the last 25 years of reported data. He takes a modest salary. His success is entirely tied up in the performance of this business not just his financial success, but his family's reputation, all kinds of intangibles, the financial well-being of his four sisters. Beyond that, we look at the history of the business. In this case, the history of first citizens that Frank's been managing. And what you've seen there is pretty extreme discipline. First citizens' charge-offs through the financial crisis were lower than those of the average bank in the US in the good years before the financial crisis. They still earned a high single-digit return on equity through 2008, which is a number that a lot of banks hope to achieve in a good year. So they have a long history of prudently managing this. When we talk to Frank, his focus is clearly on risk and managing the risk and making sure they have their arms around it. That was true with Silicon Valley Bank and CIT. A portion of that's accomplished through the deal structure. One of the more interesting things about this transaction is the way that they structured it. They have a loss sharing agreement with the FDIC, which is normal in these types of situations where the FDIC will take on some portion of the losses that are incurred and reimburse for citizens. But beyond that, they built in all kinds of other protections for for citizens, this SVB deal. They got a $35 billion term loan that can be repaid without penalty early and $35 billion of cash. So their total liquidity on the balance sheet between that and a new revolver from the FDIC is more than 100% of their deposits today. So in a world where you're worried about bank run risk, you have one of the most liquid banks relative to deposits in the country now in First Citizens. They also built out a bunch of diverse funding sources with the FDIC as a part of the agreement, some floating rate, some fixed rate, and all of them very large. And the combination means that if interest rates go up a lot, There's a way to fund the business, even in the event that SVB runs off profitably. And if interest rates go down a lot, the same is true. So they're very thoughtful about removing the interest rate risk from the equation and being able to manage any of the wide range of outcomes that might come with Silicon Valley deposits. Finally, from a capital perspective, the vast majority of conversation about banks over the last few months has been about mark-to-market risk. And this idea that there are losses on these securities portfolios. And if you have to sell those portfolios, you'll realize those losses and have insufficient equity. First Citizens post SVB deal is now sitting around 300 basis points above their regulatory capital minimums, which means they have a lot of excess capital that can be returned. 
But even more importantly, if you do that mark-to-market math that has uh, been the focus of bank investors in recent months, and you assume that they have to sell all of their securities and realize the loss from higher rates, First Citizens is still 100 basis points above their regulatory minimum in that scenario, which is extremely unusual for a U.S. bank today. The vast majority have declines well into double-digit percentages, often 50 to 70 percent of their equity. And so whether it's liquidity, whether it's the regulatory capital, whether it's the historical lending standards, there's a lot of ways in which we feel like Frank and the team are very focused on ensuring that First Citizens makes it out of this unscathed and captures this value. It certainly seems like a very proactive approach rather than reactive. I think you mentioned earlier that about a third of the deposits are still concentrated in the Carolina region. I'm just curious, in terms of the loan book today, when you often hear about the banks that you're not as familiar with that are large and public, but not the household names, there's usually some type of concentration in the loan book. Is that the case here at all? At this point, it's pretty diversified. It was primarily focused on consumers and small businesses, kind of a dentist and doctor's bank in North Carolina. CIT changed that somewhat and added a very meaningful middle market lending business, as well as a handful of other really specialized business lines, things like rail car finance or equipment financing. And then SVB has added this very large capital call business, a early and growth stage lending business. There's quite a few different exposures, and so it's relatively spread out at this point. I think in general, when we think about lending businesses, there's some loans that are really just the jump ball where the borrower is deciding based on price, and it's more of a commodity. And then there are loans where you have a relationship or you have some type of specialization where more than price is factoring into the equation. When we look at first citizens overall, it's skewed towards that latter category. And that's a good thing. That means that it's not just a price sensitive commodity in every instance here. There are a lot of situations in which someone is choosing for citizens for a different reason. That's true in the branch network and community banking network where you have, you're the primary banker for a dentist and you've been their primary banker for a long time. You know their business, you've built tailored products and services for them. You're going to get the first call when they need a loan. And that's much less likely to be priced down to the bare minimum. And there's example in CIT, where there's just specific expertise. If you're going to finance a major capital equipment purchase, or if you're a retailer and you're going to factor your receivables, CIT is a very specific expertise in those areas, special software processes, a brand, all of which helps ensure that you're making a smart loan and not just winning because you are the lowest price. Overall, that's the skew. Now, there are obviously commoditized components here, but on balance, it skews towards the types of loans where people are deciding to pick you for the right reasons. Do you expect anything in that category to change? Obviously, when you're bringing in a big bank that has a very specific strategy or a very specific concentration, as SPB did, it operates a certain way, which is probably going to look much different than how First Citizens acts. Historically, have they just sounds like with CIT allowed those brands to continue doing that and perhaps with different risk parameters. Is there anything else that might change in terms of the business now that you brought on such a large balance sheet into the business? Well, with First Citizens, they've kept those brands and business lines for the most part, but they've been up tiering the client base. They've been trying to focus on more and more credit worthy borrowers. And that's partly a function of funding cost. Part of CIT's problem historically was that they had such high funding costs that they just could not make a spread going and lending to a AAA corporate, that you needed to take some level of risk in order to get a fair spread. And that's not a great position to be in. And it's not the one that First Citizens is in today, given their low cost funding base. So they have been tailoring the CIT portfolio, pulling back risk on the margin. I'd expect something similar from Silicon Valley. A lot of it is very low risk. I think the capital call business where essentially you fund the capital going into a private equity or venture capital fund in advance until the ultimate client puts the money up. That's had something like one loss in the 30-year history that SVB had been running it. So there are components where this very much fits with first citizens mentality. And then there are components like the early stage and growth stage lending businesses where I wouldn't be surprised to hear about more of the up-tiering 
like we've heard about with CIT. I want to just hammer home that point on the cost of funds. And I think CIT is one that stood out. I can remember when Goldman was really trying to build up their asset base. They did something similar where it was way back when, when you needed a high yield savings account and most places were offering 20 basis points or 30 basis points, CIT and Goldman with their Marcus account had 160 basis points, or maybe you were getting a 2%. So what really drives that cheap asset base or low cost of funding for someone like First Citizens versus some of the others who are forced to pay to gather those assets? Well, in our view, the deposit franchise is really the primary differentiator of a bank. Lending, there can be specialized areas, there can be relationships, but a lot of it's commoditized and it's hard to have a real advantage through the cycle there. I think a lot of times in history, people have thought that they had an advantage only to realize that they didn't once there was a downturn. On the deposit side, if you have a great brand, if you have the right real estate footprint, if you're like the large banks where you can invest quite a bit into your technology and your app and provide a great experience, you can have a deposit base that will stay with you even if you're paying next to nothing in a high rate world. That's what we've seen in meaningful portions of the large banks. And it's what we've seen in First Citizens and their footprint. First Citizens is less about technology than it is about customer service. They are very well aware, as Frank would put it, that they can't be the McDonald's of banking. They're not going to be the mass market, low cost, undifferentiated provider. They are a bank where you walk in and someone knows your name where you have a relationship with the banker for a long period of time. And in their markets, in North Carolina, especially where they've been for 125 years, they have a brand. A lot of times your first bank account is the bank account your parents opened for you, or you open at the bank where your parents open. It helps to have been in that business in those markets for more than a century. So they have the brand, they have the service quality and these relationships, and it's given them a very sticky depositor base that has been willing to provide funds at a very low price, even in this higher rate market. And we can see that going back through cycles, and we've seen it through this rate period. And it's a major differentiator that, in our opinion, enables an excess return at a bank, that you have those sticky relationships that value you so much that they'll stay with you for very little yield. And historically, it's what's enabled First Citizens to earn good returns despite a low-risk lending book. This is a more thematic question, Bill. You might be the right person to answer this. I think with SVB and the rate at which that run on the bank happened, especially compared to quarterly results, which showed there was a race and mismatch and an interest rate exposure, but it seemed to happen very quickly. And you would not refer to that those as sticky assets. Once it started, it happened very quickly. Do you think that that was a signal or indicative of anything having changed with the overall markets and the ability to move funds faster, technology and the way that information can spread. Do you think there's anything that happened with that event, which should be a broader concern for the overall system? It has certainly made all bankers attuned to how easy it is to shift funds. It doesn't mean getting in your car, driving to a branch, waiting in line. Instead, you're pulling out your iPhone and you move funds in seconds. But while there's been a lot of focus on how technology has made it easier for depositors to transfer funds out of a bank, I think the real thing here was at SVB, how much of the money was tied to the same industry and some non-financially sophisticated people who look to the same leaders to help them with their financial decisions. So you have one of those leaders tweet that, he thinks people should move money out of SVB. And most of the depositors at SVB were probably followers of that person. I think where Alex has talked about First Citizens having generational relationships, SVB couldn't possibly have been in a more different position. They couldn't make a reasonable estimate of how sticky their deposits were because they hadn't had them for long enough. When I was talking in the introduction about the three risks, credit risk wasn't a problem at SVB. Liquidity risk was a big problem because they had very liquid deposits and not so liquid assets. And then duration mismatch was a problem because the deposit side of the balance sheet 
floated completely with interest rates and the asset side did not. So one of the issues is not only the investment community, but also the regulators were so backward looking and thinking about banking risk that credit risk is what got all the banks in trouble in the GFC. So the focus on the regulatory environment has been on minimizing credit risk. And ironically, we've had some of the large bank managements that we've talked to post SVB say that regulators were actually pushing them to extend duration by buying mortgage backs, just like SVB had done. So it's funny, you think about you want to protect your capital base and you also want to protect your income stream. But sometimes those are at odds with each other. And the regulators were more worried about what would happen to the earnings of the banking system if low rates or negative rates persisted or came into being than they were about what happens if rates go from nothing to 5 to 6% in a very short period of time. So I think there are some pretty unique factors at work here in addition to this technology change that's attracted all the focus of how easy it is now for people to change where they bank. Absolutely. Very interesting and a lot to learn from that experience. With all that in mind, as investors, when you are generally approaching banks, I think you've referenced some of the metrics here in terms of ROE, book value. How do you think about this as value investors yourselves? How do you think about the industry and with all of those qualitative factors in mind and thinking about those when approaching any investment, how do you think about the actual valuation of banks? I think if you look at the past generation or two of where banks trade versus the S&P 500, they've typically sold at about two-thirds of the S&P 500 multiple. We think that kind of makes sense. I think it's hard to argue that this is a better than average industry and difficult to say why banks should sell at 18 times earnings when the S&P 500 sells there. But at Oakmark, we're always looking for opportunities of where prices get out of line with both their history and what we think fundamental value is. And today, the average bank sells at probably less than half of the S&P 500 multiple, so a larger discount than it has historically. And also, we would argue the industry itself is in much better shape than it was at the time of the GFC, especially regarding credit risk. We think there's unusual opportunity in banking. I mentioned earlier to us, getting an opinion about the people in charge of various banks is one of the most important things because of the leverage and the opaqueness of the financial accounting. Capital allocation, hugely important. One of the reasons that we think the industry is more attractive today than it was pre-GFC is almost all of the leadership teams of the large banks agree that when they cannot grow at the rate they want to, making loans to creditworthy customers, they're all willing to grow by shrinking the denominator today. When there aren't organic growth opportunities, returning capital to the shareholders, both through dividends and share repurchase is central to our philosophy at Oakmark that we want managements that are comfortable giving capital back to the owners when they don't have good growth opportunities. I think book value is a good starting point. A well-run bank ought to be worth book value. It's probably hard to get much more than twice that in terms of what the underlying value could be. And it's funny, I started in this business a little over 40 years ago, and one of the rules of thumb back then was that if you're looking at a bank, the PE should roughly equate to its return on equity. So if it earns 8% on equity, it should sell at eight times earnings. If it earns 15% on equity, it could sell at 15 times earnings. And through all of the changes in the past 40 years, and whether interest rates have been near zero or up over 10%, the math behind that, that very simple PE should about equal return on equity, still approximately holds today. So for us, that's one of the other metrics that we would look at is how big a discount PE is available in the market relative to the return on equity the company is achieving. Alex, anything you would add just from a valuation perspective on First Citizens? I would just add that if you apply any of those metrics to First Citizens, you still get an attractive 
opportunity today. I think tangible book value jumped from $570 to something like $1,250 with this Silicon Valley bank transaction. The stock's just barely above one times tangible book value. A high return, reasonably fast growing bank like that, in our opinion, should be worth something closer to two times, which is where you've tended to see private market transactions take place for high quality regional peers. Same is true with the other rules of thumb that Bill talked through. You know, if you think about deposit premiums on high quality deposit franchises and a seven to ten percent deposit for premium, you'd end up with something like a two times tangible book value. You thought about an earnings multiple, you end up in that similar spot. So I think there's a lot of ways to cut it to see continued undervaluation, despite the fact that the stock's more than doubled in the last three months. One last thing I'd throw in there, Matt. First Citizens has two classes of stock. There's the regular class A stock that has normal voting rights. And then when Alex mentioned earlier that the family has about 40% voting control, despite not owning nearly that much of the underlying share base, it's because their class B shares have super voting rights. And a strange anomaly in the market today is investors are so concerned about illiquidity that these super voting shares that don't trade nearly as frequently as the regular vote shares actually traded about a 10% discount to the normal voting shares. So especially for individual investors who don't need to accumulate a large position to be meaningful to their assets and who can be in complete control of when they decide to liquidate a position in First Citizens, to us to get paid 10% to get extra voting rights seems like it makes a really good deal and even better deal. That's very interesting. And same dividend rights and everything else. It's just a matter of look, that explains that discount. Yep. When you look at the business model moving forward, there used to be these general rules of thumbs with where interest rates were and whether that would be a positive or a negative for the banks. Just thinking about First Citizen specifically, they have the acquisition and integration of acquisition, which will, I assume, take some time to fully integrate and to smooth out. But anything else that you think about as a key driver of the business model, and not that I'm asking you to make a rate call, but how important are interest rates in terms of impacting their earnings outlook and anything else that's a key variable in driving the outlook for the business? It's an interesting and kind of ironic dynamic the industry's found itself in. For a really long period of time through the 2010s, we were sitting here thinking, we need to get off this 0% interest rate floor because the high quality deposit franchise and the low quality deposit franchise, they can both pay roughly the same amount when rates are zero. And the high quality deposit franchises as a result under earn. So there was this idea that higher rates would be extremely helpful because you'd be able to flex that high quality deposit franchise value and actually realize some of it by paying less than lower quality peers on your liabilities. That happened. And you've seen meaningful net interest margin expansion for those banks. But now the industry has found itself in a different predicament, which is that the unrealized losses have increased so much from higher interest rates that at this point, it's not clear if the banks are still beneficiaries of rates being this high. And in a lot of circles, for some banks, there's fear around what if rates go higher? Those unrealized losses could expand. First Citizens is once again here in a really different spot partly owing to the Silicon Valley bank deal and partly from having managed the business differently going in. But with all the cash that they have on their balance sheet today and with the fixed funding that they got from the FDIC, they're still asset sensitive. Higher interest rates would still lead to incremental net interest income. And they, as I mentioned earlier, are are well above their regulatory minimum capital ratios, even after marking that securities portfolio to market. So there's not the same risk of having those losses really become painful from higher interest rates. So on the margin, they'd still, I think, be better off with higher rates. Now, there's a lot of flexibility in that. And they have ways that they can replace that fixed funding that they have with floating if rates should fall, which means to some extent, by virtue of having all of these options that they got through the deal, 
they're able to have a heads I win, tails you lose type situation and maintain their net interest margin either way. Now, if rates go to zero, that will change. If rates went back to zero, it'll pressure the earnings profile, but it should still be meaningfully above what it was prior to these acquisitions and in the double digits in terms of return on equity. The biggest unknown driver that we're thinking about today in terms of First Citizens' future earnings power is how much of the Silicon Valley bank deposits they maintain. This was a huge bank three months ago, and there's about $130 billion of deposits that were on Silicon Valley's books three months ago that are now gone. And there's some chance that the $41 billion of deposits that remain will continue running off and First Citizens will have to pay those down and liquidate some assets over time to do so. That is an okay scenario. You still get the 700 something dollars of tangible book value accretion. And that was real value created for shareholders. But we're a lot better off if we can maintain that $41 billion of deposits and actually grow it over time. So the big question is, of that 130 that left and that 41 that's still there, can they win some of that back? Can they explain how this is now a safer bank how it doesn't have the risks that SBB had, but still has that value proposition and service quality and start to bring some of that money back onto its own balance sheet. If it can, that 700 something dollars they added to tangible book value per share should be worth something much larger than $700 to first citizens as you grow that earnings power off that base. An interesting dynamic with SBB was also that they were transacting or helping with the transactions. They act as somewhat of a capital markets participant for many of the companies that then ended up putting their deposits with the bank. Is that a business that they still plan to be in? It seems like it differs from First Citizen's traditional business. No, they did not acquire the securities business, actually. That was carved out. Interesting. And how important do you think that is? Because it did seem to be a big driver of deposit growth. And I think many folks often talk about SVB drowning in deposits, where you saw a period of time where many of these tech companies raised a substantial amount of capital. SVB was a key driver in helping those companies do that. And essentially, it led to them parking a lot of those assets at SVB. Just in terms of the overall system, it does not seem to be that important for first citizens, given they seem to have a much different strategy towards asset gathering. But I guess when you think about SVB and the ability to hold on to those remaining assets, is that a consideration in terms of their ability to do that? You mentioned the trust factor, but I just wonder how much of it factors into what the original reasoning was for those assets being with SVB. It's possible it matters and it's possible it matters quite a bit. But I'd emphasize that these deposits are down so dramatically from where they started. If two thirds of the balances were attributable to the securities business, we've already lost more than two thirds. And so off of this base, it's less clear. And I think there's some room to absorb that having been a big driver. There's also components where it's clearly driven by something non-securities related. For instance, they have their winery business where they lend to winemakers and they publish a industry periodical magazine. They have all kinds of survey data. They have different ways of looking at lending to wineries than the rest of the industry, thinking more about asset value than the cash flow that's differentiated them in that market. There's components of the value proposition like that, that are completely separate from the securities business that also matter. We don't know. I think the important thing from our perspective is that the worst case scenario is that you get the $700 or so of tangible book value coming back dollar good as you liquidate it over time. The best case scenario is that they find a way to maintain or grow some of this, and it's worth more than 700. But we're pretty comfortable that we don't have to believe the latter in order to think the stock's attractive today. I think one of the interesting things in terms of trying to retain the SVB deposits, because of First Citizen's background buying banks the FDIC was selling, as Alex said, the day this deal got signed, First Citizens had people in California meeting with the important relationships managers from SVB, encouraging them to give First Citizens a shot. And in terms of that winery business, I read in an industry publication just last week that the relationship manager in charge of most of the wine business for SVB 
was encouraging the winemakers to give first citizens a shot. So the chance that the observation that that individual has become an ally for first citizens, I think is a very good sign as to the possibility that first citizens will retain some of this business. That's consistent broadly with what we've been hearing from first citizens, which is that they've had a big effort to reach out to former depositors that took their money out of the bank. They've been trying to rebuild those relationships, and they're seeing some encouraging signs. Now, it's very early. There's a wide range of outcomes, but they're seeing some signs of success in bringing people back to Silicon Valley Bank based on their outreach. Yeah, it's an interesting thing that a business very much seems to be driven by relationships. It's a contact sport, and they understand that. So it makes them well-suited for that type of environment where relationships matter quite a bit. And most people are looking for someone to speak to, to understand things. Acquisitions have been part of the DNA. I think the bigger you get, the tougher it becomes to create future acquisitions and complete future acquisitions. Does that matter much? How do you think about their ability to do this more in the future? Does it matter if they are bigger and the acquisitions are just a smaller piece of the pie? How much is that core to your thesis, their ability to participate in some of these auctions and just acquisitions generally? It's important potential upside to the values that we were talking about earlier. I don't think it's required to believe that it's a cheap stock today, but it could be value additive. There are still every year going to be bank failures. And on occasion, those can be pretty large and they do have this competency. And so from time to time, can they buy one of these targets in a really capital light way? When they took over Silicon Valley Bank from the FDIC, they didn't have to put up a dollar. They were essentially given the loans at a discount. You're not issuing equity. You're not using all of your excess capital. It's a very capital efficient way to grow. And I'd imagine that this isn't the last one of those we'll see. It would be hard to see them be this impactful as a percentage going forward. It might be tough under this administration, but there's potential for large bank M&A. I mean, they are far below that 10% hurdle at which you're not able to buy any more deposit market share. At the 16th largest bank in the United States, there's lots of potential for mergers of equals. I do think that the recent crisis has shown the importance of size and diversification to the market and potentially to regulators. And that also could change how consolidation is viewed. I think they could double once more in size before they'd be top 10. Regulation, you mentioned it with banks. It's just a consideration at a very high level, and it could go in a million different directions. But how do you think of First Citizens under the regulatory framework as being advantage, disadvantage, or neutral? And how much is regulation key in terms of de-risking the potential banking system or anything related to first citizens? I think the biggest clear conclusion over the last decade or so is that the very largest banks have been disadvantaged. You've allowed all the smaller regionals, still top 25 banks, not global systematically important banks. You've allowed all of those banks to run with meaningfully less capital, far less liquidity, far less debt, a bunch of different characteristics that enabled those banks to earn higher returns than the very largest banks. Obviously, the very largest banks came through this crisis, at least thus far, unscathed, and were actually net beneficiaries. So that playing field, it sounds like, will be leveled. Everyone is talking about incremental liquidity rules and incremental required debt issuance from the regionals. That will, to some extent, if that applies to first citizens, weigh on the returns relative to what they had earned historically. Now, the big offset is that they also did just bulk up and there are meaningful economies of scale in banking. And that's part of the reason that the large banks have been able to earn pretty good returns despite all of the headwinds that came from this incremental regulation. I think the returns will still be adequate. The industry will adjust if they aren't. But the difference between the first citizens of the world and the large banks seems pretty likely to narrow in terms of regulation. When I started in this industry, I think there were 14,000 some banks a little more than 40 years ago. And we have maybe 25% of that number today, just over 3,000. I think both in politics and in the communities at large, people have a misperception that the small number of banks relative to what we used to have means banking has become more inconvenient. 
we actually have more than twice as many branches today as we had 40 years ago. So the distance somebody has to drive to their local bank has actually gone down. My hope is that from a regulatory perspective, and even just like a political perspective, that this drumbeat that we need to keep all the small banks independent, that that might die down. There are such strong economies of scale in banking that to earn the same rate of return, a small bank has to take incrementally much more risk, and it's not good for the system. And when the small banks get acquired, they inherit better technology, more economies of scale, better regulatory compliance. I think it's actually good for the system to see more mergers and acquisitions in banking. And people say like, oh, wouldn't it be awful if we got down to a world where we only had 20 banks in the United States? I'm not so sure why that would be a bad thing. You answered my question there. I was going to ask you what you thought the threshold might be where it tilts unfavorably to the system. Certainly, there are many examples of countries outside the United States where they have a much smaller number of banks per 100,000 in the population, and it doesn't seem to be creating any negatives for them. Risks. I think we've talked about risks throughout the conversation, but if you were to isolate the most important risk for First Citizens, what would you identify? A handful. I think that the management here has created so much value over time. There is, to some extent, key man risk that comes with that, especially having the bank being family control. Now, Frank's been pretty clear to us that it's not necessarily going to be a family member to take the helm after him, that he said, we all have way too much money invested in this thing to let an idiot run it. I feel reasonably comfortable with him making that decision, but it's hard to imagine them finding someone that will add as much value to the company down the road as he has. More broadly, the bank's increased its size very rapidly. That comes with needs to integrate risk systems, liquidity management systems, all types of different reporting mechanisms. And it comes with incremental burdens in terms of stress tests. And there's an element of execution risk associated with that and regulatory risk that to the extent that some of those systems are not up to par, you'd likely have the Fed in some way respond. I think that the risks that most people talk about today for banks like the mark-to-market on securities really aren't that meaningful here. I think most of the other banking risks like credit that we've covered in this conversation aren't that meaningful. And so it's a very different set of considerations than it is for most of the banks that investors own today. One closing question on the interest rate dynamics, which I didn't ask before, is you have the change lower to higher but then also the speed at which it changes and the volatility within interest rates. Is more volatility better or worse? And I frame that within the context of we had this low interest rate environment for such a long period of time that a large percentage of those books have adjusted towards being consisting of very low interest rate environment loans. Does the speed at which that changes have much impact on the risk to the banks? If the latest rate increases had happened more slowly, you wouldn't have the mark-to-market issues to the same extent that you have today because more of it would have matured. On the other hand, with more time comes more time for deposit costs to adjust. So it's a mixed bag. I think the volatility, there's a big difference between 400 basis points of volatility of rates going from two up to four and then back down to two compared to one-way volatility where they go from two to four and then to six. And I think the magnitude of the change that we've seen in the past year, along with how rapidly it happened and it was all in one direction, really was like a perfect storm for the companies in the industry that thought they had more stable deposit bases than they actually had. You answered the question that I should have asked, which is if it had gone slower, what would have been the difference there? So, uh, That's excellent. We close these conversations out with lessons that you might be able to take away from looking at the business and apply elsewhere as an investor. Does anything stand out for First Citizens in terms of a lesson from looking at this business that you think applies more broadly? I think one of the strongest lessons here, and it's something that 
is important across Oakmark's investment philosophy, regardless of the industry we're investing in, is investing with managements that think long term and behave like owners rather than professional managers. I think the focus here on maximizing growth in long term per share tangible book value, and it works here because tangible book is such a strong correlation to true intrinsic value, was a real separator for First Citizens over the past decade and also sets up well for them as we look going forward. When we first bought this stock, it wasn't even in our set of possibilities that they could do another acquisition that doubled their scale and doubled tangible book value when they did it. But when you align with managements that have skin in the game and behave like owners, the things that you can't model tend to skew to the very positive side. And we've been a beneficiary of that at First Citizens. And I think investors over the next decade will continue to benefit from that. I would just add from a director of research perspective, there can be a lot of group think in the investment world. And there's all these communities of investors and social media, and various names become in vogue and not in vogue at various points in time. And there are hedge fund dinners where everybody's sharing their best ideas and the ideas percolate through the system. And this is a company that was not on anyone's radar, wasn't brought up in these idea dinners, didn't have long threads on Twitter. And it emphasizes, I think, the value of really doing your own work and just turning over rocks, trying to find the best opportunities, even if that's not something that is being written up on all the popular websites and talked in the investing communities. There's real value in that. I still think it's amazing that we were one of the very few active value managers that owned this stock prior to the Silicon Valley Bank deal when it was already such a large bank with such an excellent track record. It tells you something, I think, about the sourcing process and different ways to create value. I think you're 100% right. I can attest to not being familiar with this name and almost being embarrassed when we started discussing the research for this one. And I think you hit it on the head there. Bill, Alex, this has been an excellent discussion, a timely discussion, not just on First Citizens, but overall on the banking system. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. To find more episodes of Breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com. 